Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're so glad you joined us. And I am so excited to have one of my good friends, Carl Medeiros. Uh, for those of you who have hung out with me or around me for the last decade or so, probably know Carl because I've had him speak at uh, Vineyard Church when I was pastoring Vineyard Church, and we've traveled together, we've hung out a lot together, and I would, and I'm so thankful to have Carl in my life. Carl's an author, he's a speaker, he is a expert in the Middle East Arab Muslim world. He's a uh, guest on Al Jazeera out there. He's been a columnist in the Huntington Post. Uh, man, entrepreneur. He is so many things. <laughs> but what I like the best is uh, we've been able to do a little life together, and he's a friend. So thanks, yeah. Carl. Thanks, man. I agree. Here, here. Yeah. So for those who, of our audience who don't know you, let's let's let them have a little bit of backstory, like where you were born, kind of your family wow. of origin, you know. PK kid, all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, I was born in Oregon, raised in Nebraska, moved to Colorado when I was 16. Uh, my dad was a somebody's a God pastor. And so I grew up a pastor's kid. And, and, you know, my experience with that wasn't really bad. It was, it was, I would say it's kind of neutral. It was, it was, you know, a lot of pastors, kids have horrible experiences. Mine wasn't horrible, <clears throat> but there's some baggage that comes with that for sure. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, church, for sure, all my life growing up. Uh, and as somebody's a God, you know, you, you can lose your salvation. So I got saved. I got re-saved almost every Sunday. My dad would give an altar call on Sunday night and look at me, you know, it was like, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you lost your salvation yeah. this week. You get up exactly. here and give your life to exactly. Jesus again. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So... Um, yeah, and but then very early on, I knew I wanted to be a missionary. And you know, see, that's and different than a Baptist kid because the Baptist kids just feel guilty. They're still saved, but they just feel right. guilty. Exactly. So they just live a life of guilt ridden. They don't, you know, it'd right. probably be better just to get re saved again. Then you feel it's all clean saved. again. Yeah. And yeah. Exactly. That was exactly, I was guilty, but then I knew how to get rid of it. Just go for an alcohol call and just get get saved. Oh, again. God. I'm very saved. I've been saved thousands and thousands of times. Uh, so and then. You know, then early on thought I'd be a missionary and my parents thought that was cool. And everybody I knew, you know, in that world, you know, the hierarchy was like, you know, youth pastor and then assistant pastor and then senior pastor and then missionary, like missionary was the coolest thing ever, you know, and we all pretend, of course, there's no hierarchy, but that's how it felt, at least back then. And went with YWAM, Youth of the Mission, for a year when I was 20, 21 years old in 1983. And that was a great experience. Went to Holland for a DTS, a discipleship training school. And uh, went off to Yemen for three months and did my first Middle East missions experience in Yemen, which basically meant I had dysentery for three months and <laughs> didn't speak Arabic, so couldn't communicate with anybody. So yeah, it was really effective. So that was probably my first foray into often ineffective Christian missions to the rest of the world, I experienced it myself thinking most days, why, why am I here? You know, cause I couldn't tell them anything. And I couldn't even talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I was just sick the whole time, but, and they just thought I was weird. They're like, why is this weird white guy out here vomiting and having <laughs> diarrhea all over our country? What's, what's his deal? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think they must have all wondered and then got married to my wonderful wife, now of 35, almost 36 years, Chris. Mm -hmm. Limberopolis, as you might guess, she comes from a Greek background. And um, have three kids that are all now young adults, one in Chicago, one in Denver, one in Seattle. Uh, and then we, in, in between with this 
two of these kids, we moved to Beirut, Lebanon, 1992. Two little baby girls, Anna and Marie, were like 17 months and three months old when we left Colorado Springs. <clears throat> moved to Beirut, pretty crazy, 1992. Mm -hmm. And then our third child, our son John, was born over there. He was actually born in Damascus, Syria. Um, and lived there for 12 years, moved back to the States, did some writing, wrote some books, a lot of speaking, back and forth to the Middle East. You and I went on, you know, some trips to the Middle East together. And um, Yeah, in fact, um, you know, I remember, I think I met you the first time in like maybe right around 96 mm -hmm. um, in Anaheim mm -hmm. at a National Vineyard Pastors Conference maybe in so. Anaheim. Yeah. And I remember I was wanting to get involved in Arab missions and I was right. hunting around and somebody said, well, you need to meet Carl Medeiros. And I can't remember if it was, did you know Steve Shogren back then or? Not then. No, I didn't know okay. Steve. So went to have been um, I was, I, don't, I can't remember who it was, but yeah. I think we ended up having lunch sitting out there in one of the tents. Yeah, we did. And, uh, yeah, and that was when we first met, yep. talked about, about that. Talked about Palestinians, talked about Palestinians and Arabs in general and Muslims. And, yeah. and I was still thinking in a very traditional evangelical, like go and, go and save all the, convert yeah. all the, yeah. you know, so, all the Arab Muslims. The heathens. To, to Christianity. Amen, brother. <laughs> Amen. To make them Christians. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I was thinking that all the way up until we went there in 1992, you know, it was kind of, fairly well trained and and you know knew that Christianity was the correct religion and anybody that was not part of that obviously was going to hell and and mostly even if you were part of it if you weren't our version of that you also might still be going to hell like there was like a little bit maybe nicer hell for Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists but it was still not you know they weren't quite you basically had to be charismatic or Pentecostal or you weren't, you know, you weren't, you weren't really in. So, but I think back, I mean, I can say now with laughter because it's, you either have to laugh or cry because it was so sad, but so it wasn't just non-Christians. It was like, you kind of had to be the right brand of Christian mm -hmm. or we weren't so sure. And definitely mm -hmm. Muslim. If you're a Muslim, then obviously you're not right. And then yeah. we should go convert you to our religion. Right. And that was the idea when I showed up there. That was, and it took me like three days, literally, to have this epiphany going, you know, Muslims don't like the religion of Christianity. They already have a religion. And Christianity is so tied to the West and specifically America. And America and the Muslim Arab world haven't always done that well together, partly because of our love for Israel, that maybe, maybe my message, or at least the packaging of the message isn't correct. Yeah. But right away, I figured out something was amiss with how I was preaching the Christianity, you know. Yeah, and Christianity and crosses and churches, all yeah. symbolic Crusades. of not only crusades and, you know, Christians killing Muslims and all, you know, just yeah. a horrible, horrible history of all of that, right? Yeah, yeah, so, it is a, yeah, a horrible history. And we think of the crusades like an American missionary would feel, would feel no connection to the crusades because that wasn't us i didn't do that it was you know somebody back in europe a thousand years ago but but when you go around the middle east like in lebanon there are still crusader castles right right you know and, yeah. and they're tourist places now that muslims take people like us to go show them and i know i just want to say why you know why did why are you want to show me this crusader castle and so for them it's just like the day before yesterday when that happened. And then uh, I don't know if you remember this or not, Fred, but after 9-11, remember when President Bush, George W. Bush, stood on top of the rubble and grabbed a bullhorn from the firefighter in a very spontaneous moment, said, you know, uh, never, you know, we'll, you know, we'll never forget, never forget. And, and we are on a crusade against evil. He used the phrase, we are on a crusade against. Now, in his mind, I, he surely wasn't making any connection to the crusaders of that mm -hmm. crusade, but you know it's the generic use of the word crusade. But when that was replayed in the Muslim world, that the American Christian quote Christian president said we are on a crusade against evil, and a month later American troops are in Iraq 
the, uh, right? The connection seems yeah. uh, it's obvious to every Muslim. Here yeah. we go again. The, right. the, the Christians yeah. invaded. We're coming over here to kill, Christians yeah. are coming over to kill us again. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, it, so it, yeah, p- pause there just for a minute. Like you're like you you went you're we're in Beirut right now. Your family's there. You've got two young kids there, but you're did your fascination with the Middle East, your love for the Middle East start when you went to Yemen with YWAM? Or was it even before then? Because I, I, I seem to recall that you went over there and lived in a Bedouin tribe or something like that for a little while. No, that was or, in Yemen. That was in Yemen. Oh, was, was it? Yeah, when I was, okay. 20, when I was 21, I just turned 21 and was in Yemen for three months. And we were in a tent with, okay. Yemeni, you know, kind of semi-nomadic, you know, okay. Bedouins are technically nomadic Arabs, but right. these are kind of semi-nomadic Yemeni Bedouins. That was when I was. That was 1983. That was okay. spring of 83. All right. But yeah, but even before then, like growing up, you know, in a, you know, kind of a conservative, politically conservative, religiously conservative, Assemblies of God, Zionist church setting, I somehow liked Palestinians. I used to think Yasser Arafat was cool, and was surely at least misunderstood. And I don't even know why I thought that. Like we had no. Muslims in Nebraska. Mm-hmm. There were no Arabs. I didn't, I'd never met an Arab, but I was, I but loved you'd watched, Arab. you'd watched Lawrence of Arabia. I, Lawrence of Arabia, <laughs> and Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, I, the seven pillars. I mean, I actually knew, I actually knew a lot about the Middle East as a teenager. Yeah. And I can only assume, I for sure then would have assumed, it was still assumed that somehow God put that in my brain, in my head, in my heart, you know, to, to be fascinated with such a bizarrely out out there sort of culture that wasn't related to me in any way. Yeah. It was just in me. Yeah. So when I finally got a chance to go to Yemen when I was 21 with YWAM, I jumped on it. I was so excited. Yeah. You know, and it was yeah. a bit disillusioning then. Like I said, you know, I basically just was sick and couldn't speak the language. So it wasn't very effective. There was no powerful, amazing, cool stories from right. me. Right. Right. But still, I loved it. Yeah. So, okay, let's, let's jump back to Beirut. You land there and very quickly you realize that you're at least your packaging of this mission that you were on needed to change. You, you, you intuitively picked up on that like super fast. Right. And, and that the, the, you said it right. Initially it was just the packaging. I don't think the substance in my head was changing. I, I still thought Muslims should come, they should become Christians, but but I think I thought, you know, maybe I should stop saying the word Christian because I don't like that word because that word Christian is connected to Christianity, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so I started talking about Christ more. And then and then I went from kind of Christ to his name, which isn't Christ. His name is not Christ. His name is Jesus. I mean, in English, his name is Jesus. Mm-hmm. One of his titles is Christ, but his name is Jesus. So then I started saying Jesus, but I was still saying, you know, that I was a follower of Jesus. So I actually thought of this as all very clever missiology. This was my, my new missions language. Right. Was that I'll be a quote follower yeah. of Jesus, yes. not a Christian. You know, isn't yeah. that clever? <laughs> you know? You're 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 indigenizing the gospel in Lebanon. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. But I'm yeah. still doing it with the same motivation of making Muslims Christians. And I'm not a you know universalist. And then so I'm not thinking, well, they're fine. I'm thinking, well, of course they're not fine. They're going to hell. And I should, you know, rescue them. And I mean, God should, or I should. I got that confused a lot. Was it me rescuing them or was it God? But one of us, or together maybe. Maybe together we were doing this, you know, mm-hmm. very important work. Mm-hmm. And the word Christian wasn't working. Christianity doesn't make sense there. And it's church actually, you know. church doesn't make sense either, right? Well, the church doesn't make sense anywhere. But, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, it definitely didn't make sense there. <laughs> No, I, I shouldn't say that because I have to be fair. If we're playing this game fairly, I have to remember the Carl Maduris of 1992. So the Carl Maduris of 1992 wouldn't have said what I just said. I wouldn't yeah. have said, you know, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the real church, the, yeah. the body of Christ uh, does make sense. Not everything we do makes sense, but, you know, right. I would have been more fair about that, but still skeptical and still yeah. suspicious of it for sure, even then. Right. Uh, knowing some things weren't quite right, knowing some things need to be like anybody, like you talk to any good evangelical conservative pastor and ask them, you know, are there some things in the church that need to be 
changed, you would say, well, yeah, of course, right? Yeah. We all we all kind of know that. Yeah. But yeah, it was packaging at the time. It was a repackaging of the same thing, yeah. which is better than not. I mean, it's better than not. You, yeah. And you started what? Uh, the all, Did you call it Olive Grove or something at uh, yeah. American University there in Beirut? Is that what you yeah, did? We started, yeah, the Olive Grove. We started kind of reaching out to university students. We had some stuff with the poor. We had some, you know, pretty cool humanitarian stuff going on. We did everything. We did kind of traditional door-to-door evangelism with the Jesus film, the Jesus film in Arabic and a, like a New Testament and hand it, give it to people. And mm-hmm. Muslims were by and large very gracious and took it and, you know, um, and then we did street preaching. We did worship on the streets with an Arabic worship band. Um, we did more relational stuff like the Olive Grove was more come and hang out with your friends we did humanitarian stuff. We started some uh, schools. We did medical relief work. You know, we there was a whole pile of us that kind of followed us over there. And we did kind of A to Z. And, and I would say, again, trying to remember what was in my head and heart then, I would say with good intentions and good, I mean, I, I'd say, uh, you know, mostly good intentions and good motives. And there was no... There was no gotcha. It wasn't like you could have medical treatment if you pray the sinner's prayer and get saved. There was none of that. I and mean, it wasn't it wasn't the corny, cheesy mission stuff that none of us ever liked. It was good hearted missions mm-hmm. stuff. And, you know, and we do things at the time, the stage of life that we're all in, we do the best we can at that time. And sure, what sure. I thought was true and what I believed about God and Jesus and the Bible and the church and missions was true. I had integrity of the 30 year old version of Carl. I think I had integrity. Yeah. It, you know, if I did it the same way now, of course, now the 60 year old version of Carl, which I am now would do things differently, but right. That's, that's life, right? That's what we grew up. But doors, uh, some relationships started opening up to you while you're in Beirut. That, that, was it was it relationships with Muslims that you really became close to that began to sort of shift not just the packaging but actually the way you thought deeply about Muslims and about Christians and about their relationship yeah. with each other? Was it? Yeah. What yeah, would you well, say? Was it? Yeah, fr- just, was the the actual friendships that developed with Muslims that began to shape you more? It was that, <laughs> and yeah. And it was some, it was a new circle of friends I got into, you know, around the National Prayer Breakfast here in the States that also helped with that. A guy named Doug Coe, who was kind but of what uh, year did you intersect with him? 98, 1998. So I would okay. say Beirut from 92 to 98, those six years was a lot of evangelistic fervor. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of, you know, big things and speaking in a tent and, and preaching in a mosque and going door to door and street evangelism. I got put in jail several times and and uh, then they would keep saying, Carl, you can't do that. And then I'd say, oh, sorry, but I'm going to keep doing it. And then, you know, and uh, ironically, those years put me on the map in the Christian missions world in the Middle East because people thought that was so cool what I was doing. Yeah, you were risking your life for the gospel. I was risking my life for the gospel. For sure, we, for sure. You know, missions, you, and I actually yeah. was. Yeah, and you I were. <laughs> I was doing that. You know, yeah. not, we don't we don't have to put quotes around it. I actually right. was doing that. You know. Yeah. And and again, to be fair, I, without regret, I would say without any regret. Um, and I think God used that, and um, and it had an impact on me, and it taught me things about courage and and bravery and and Jesus and value in my life versus other things that might, might be bigger than my life and all kinds of things in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good for my wife. I have three kids who all still love Jesus completely. And I think part of that is because, you know, a lot of kids who grew up in pastors or missionary homes who fall away from God do so because they realize their dad or mom were hypocrites to a certain degree. They saw them talking in churches about all these cool things, but they know the real person. Well, in, in our case, I have to say our kids actually all knew and still know that dad and mom are committed to Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there was no, 
like our kids saw us. Our, our, I, got, I got kidnapped and held at gunpoint in Iraq once, and we decided to go back to Iraq two days later, or two weeks later, and I got all three of our kids who are at that time, you know, just pre-teenagers and smart enough to know what had happened to dad that I'd almost died. And I said, do you think I should go back to Iraq? And our oldest daughter, Anna said, dad, this is what, this is what you do. And so they all basically said, of course, of course you go back. And, hmm. uh, and so our kids were all in on this yeah. thing that we're doing, you know, right. so there were no, it wasn't, a, a, there was no hypocrisy. It doesn't mean that what we were doing was always great or the right way to do it maybe, but at least there was no hypocrisy. Yeah. I wasn't saying one thing and doing another thing. And I remember I was trying to get over there in the nineties. And when, when was the first infatata? It, I mean, that probably would have been about 98. Okay. And yeah. so, the, yeah. So about shortly after we met, I was trying to get over there and then the yeah. first infatata took place. Yeah. So then I yeah. didn't go. Right. And then I just remember finally that kind of calmed down. I was getting ready to try to get over there again. 2001, I think. And then 9 11 <laughs> happened, right? You were really, I think you were coming in October of 2001 and then, you know, September 11th. Yeah. Now, I know? literally think that's right. Yeah. yeah because I, yeah. Messed that up. So I don't think, mm -hmm. what was the first time you came over? Well, I think it was the first trip that I, that I did with that whole vineyard group. Uh huh. What was Remember, that? Was that? Yeah, I can't. I, I'm probably. terrible at dates. Yeah, probably. 2005. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. 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 Some somewhere so, in there. Yeah, I think I think that's you. You must have this, Fred, as you've changed and evolved and morphed and grown and whatever. You know, it's hard. It, I have to be fair to the 30 year old version of Carl and the 40 year old version of Carl and the 50 year old version of Carl. I have yeah. to be fair to what I was feeling and believing and thinking at that time, some of it could have been hypocritical. Some of it could have been to raise support with a good missionary newsletter, you know, right. some of it could have been that. But I have to say for the most part, our 12 years in Beirut from 92 to 2004, even as I'm changing in my theology and my methodology, I was always at least trying to be uh, as as honest with myself and others and with God as I could be. Sure. And now I look back on that and I, some, I roll my eyes on some things that I believed. And yeah. I thought, but okay, well, that's where I was. Yeah. yeah. Well, you influenced me because I, that first trip I took over there with you, you know, I, and if that was 2005, whenever that was, it was after nine 11. It was interesting because uh, right after nine 11 was when I opened up my first actual physical facility we'd been meeting in a middle school prior to that and we doubled overnight we right. literally went from 400 to 800 almost instantly and it took it had taken us 10 years to grow to 400 and then we just kept growing and growing and growing and just a lot of people came to church right after 9 11 and we we just happened to have our grand opening in the new facility the sunday after 9 11 right, right. then but i'd hung out with you enough to where I remember hearing all the messages that were being preached from evangelicals about how God was judging America for the homosexuals. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I wasn't there. Right. Even though I was definitely evangelical Fred, I wasn't there. And I remember having Steve Shogren in and we went and served the local mosque in Kansas city right after nine 11. And yeah. I just had Steve on a couple of weeks ago and we shared that story oh, wow. on the podcast again. And then I had you in. Yeah, you did. And uh, and I was I was very risky to talk about loving Muslims right after 9-11. We're literally I from the stage. Like, I think it was three weeks, two or three weeks after 9-11. On the stage and hundreds of people right after 9-11, we start talking about loving Muslims. So even though I was Mr. Evangelical Fred, and then when I got over there with you the first time, I don't know, I'm sure you remember our long arguments. Oh, yeah. We'd sit in the car and we'd be oh, traveling yeah. somewhere to some place. Oh, yeah. And by that time, you had already made shifts out of just the packaging into some very foundational viewpoints. Share, share, try to give a little short, like, if you remember some of those arguments we were I having, do. share those. <laughs> yeah, share them. Because, well, see, I you you influenced me <laughs> and you you made me think hard. And I, yeah. even though I would have argued with you at the moment, I would go back and read and think and, yeah. Yeah. and you eventually, you eventually, you know, 
won me to your side, Carl, you know? <laughs> yes. No, I, got but, <laughs> I, got, I got a convert. No, Just but it one. was, but yeah. I began, it really helped me to begin mm. to see things through a different lens, which I think, you know, I, now I see it even way differently, but, but yeah. then it was like, we were arguing over these things. You may, you may have surpassed me. <laughs> yeah now, well we Fred, won't come back come back Fred. Yeah. come back yeah right we won't go there right now but yeah, anyway. yeah, not, yeah we're not there yet <laughs> well i mean as i remember it and you you if, if this is actually a fun discussion to have that's a real live discussion that we're actually having yeah, we're in the middle east yeah, yeah you've got mr you've got mr evangelical megachurch pastor with you right, right. we're having arguments about how to win muslims which i know nothing about Right, but but yet yeah, as a good evangelical, you know, pastor, I, I think I know something about. Yeah, you're still arguing your point <laughs> very strongly, you know, and right. you're good at that. And, <laughs> and and I gave it time because I respected you, and I respected your theological mind, and I respected you as a person, and we were becoming friends, and you know, so of course we're having real conversations at that time, and and I'm just I'm at the point then that this would have been in the early and mid two thousands because I think we. We had this ongoing discussion probably for, you know, for several years yeah. uh, where I was kind of saying Muslims can stay Muslim in their context and still follow Jesus, right? Which was a crazily controversial thing to say in any, in any circle, let alone to, as you call yourself, evangelical Fred. You know, yeah. which I like. That's a great title. <laughs> um, that's the title of a book right there. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, I, and so in my mind, the shift is now in my heart, the shift has now fully happened from just repackaging the gospel. And so I'm not, I'm no longer just saying I'm a quote follower of Jesus rather than a Christian, because the words follower of Jesus make more sense to a Muslim than the word Christian does. I, I am doing that, but not just for the semantics of it. I'm doing it for the heart. And I'm, I'm studying the gospels again. I'm reading Jesus fresh for the first time, often through the, the, the mind and eyes and ears of my Muslim friends who, you know, we have the scriptures opened. Uh, I, one of my best friends, a guy named Hisham, a Muslim professor at the American University of Beirut, said to me one day, I had challenged him to read the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, you know, I told him where it was in this book called Matthew. It's the first book in the New Testament. It's chapters. You'll see numbers at the top of the you know, pages number five and number six and number seven. And it was like three pages long. You should just read it. He came back to me the next day and he goes, Carl, have you read that? And I said, yeah, I have read it. He goes, I don't, I'm so confused. And his mind, his mind was just like exploding you know, because he, you know, he just thought, is Jesus serious? <laughs> yeah, I think he actually said that. Do you think yeah. Jesus was serious? Because he says things like, don't judge, but everybody judges. Don't worry, but everybody worries. And and love your enemies. And don't say this. You've heard it said this, but I say this. And we're all, he goes, Carl, do you know that we've all committed adultery? According to <laughs> Jesus, we've all committed adultery. You know, and, and for a Muslim, like for a Christian, that's bad. That's not a good thing. We're not supposed to do things like that. You know, and so he, his, you know, you could just like if he was in a cartoon, there would have been smoke coming out of his ears. You know, like in the cartoons yeah. of the most growing up. And so, and, I and was shift. he was he familiar? Like, because so many Muslims aren't even really tuned into the Jesus in the Quran, right? Right. Right. And was he tuned into Jesus in the Quran? Okay. He was, yeah. Okay. So he was, he was a he was a religious he was a history professor at the AUB, but a okay. religious scholar and had a PhD in Islamic uh, history. And he, and he did know about Jesus, you know, being highly venerated in the Quran. Right. And so he respected, like most Muslims, he had a respect for Jesus, but and had respect theoretically for the Bible, as right. Muslims do theoretically, but not actually because he had never really read it. Well, I got him reading that and it was blowing his mind. The stuff about Jesus was blowing his mind. And I started to realize more and more and more that if you unleash Jesus, if you just set Jesus of Nazareth loose, not the Christian Christ from America who is white from Dallas, Texas, not that version, <laughs> that's not the real one. That's the heretical Jesus. But the real Palestinian Jewish brown skin, big nose, short guy Jesus, which he would have been. 
if you let him loose, he is unbelievable. He's actually way more radical than the Christian Jesus I'd been preaching. And it's not dumbing Jesus down. It's ramping him up like times a million because he says things and he does things that are so counter-religious and so counter-cultural. He pisses off. He says to the Pharisees, you travel a hundred miles to make a single convert. And when you do, you make him twice the son of the devil as you are. Like that's what he says to yeah. his evangelical crowd of the day. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, and so yes. you say things like that to Muslims and other non-Christian right. groups. And they're like, what? Yeah. Jesus says, yeah. You think you're mad at Christians. You should see Jesus. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just heard Frank Schaefer quote that, that oh, very really? line out of, oh. you know, you, I don't awesome. know if you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Frankie <laughs> Favors, yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's there. Well, and then, and then of course, what started yeah. happening to me, Fred, is, you know, and this was part of the underpinning of your and my conversation is that, you know, had I become liberal, I must have become liberal in my theology. I no longer believed in the good Bible-believing conservative Christian theology. But it turns out I've actually become conservative. I'm conservative in my reading of the scripture. I actually believe what Jesus said and believe what he did. And it was anti, not just non-religious, it was anti-religious. Yeah. And we all kind of know that. And we kind of play with that a little bit, but only to a certain degree because we're still in a religious box. And so we were talking about, can you be a Muslim religiously, a Muslim and follow Jesus? And I would say things like, well, Fred, can you be a Christian and follow Jesus? That seems like a non sequitur to me. And then you're like, what? Of course, of course. But Christian, turns out Christians know where in the Bible. Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was Jewish. The apostles weren't Christians. They first got called Christians at Antioch by somebody who called them that. We don't know if that was a derogatory name or what or what it was, but they yeah. were called that. Right. But yeah. they were all they were a bunch of Jewish people. They were Jews or Gentiles, but they weren't Christians. And Jesus didn't start a new religion. So can you be a Muslim and be a, a follower of Jesus? Of course you can be. Yeah. Of course. In fact, yeah. that may be the best kind. Yeah. The question is, can you go to a white mega church in the Midwest and be a follower of Jesus? I don't know. It's yeah. not easy. It's I think yeah. you can, but it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is uh I I totally get it now. Right. But I didn't totally get it then for sure. Why not? What what do you think? Let's try remember the Fred Heron I mean, 2005. Why what what five? Uh, Man, you know, I mean, I I still think that I was, God, there's so many things, Carl. It's hard, you know, I've unpacked so much of that stuff. Um, I'm interviewing you now. Right. No, but uh, seriously, because I still have yeah. that, but I still have the yeah. lots of Christian friends who still don't get it. And they're like, and it, it makes me sound like I'm just I mean, I, liberal. I mean, I just thought being a Muslim automatically right. X'd you out of being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, or or going to heaven, even for that matter. And I thought being a Buddhist ex automatically axed you out, and being a Hindu automatically axed you out, and being a Native American Indian automatically, you know, axed you out. And for pretty much anything that wasn't, and and I probably grew up because I grew up Southern Baptist, like even Catholics might be suspect, although I thought some Catholics could probably slip in there, you know, oh, totally. and um, you know, so. You know, there were, I was suspicious of like, you had to kind of fall into this really super evangelical box. Right. And I, boy, I just don't see it like that at all now. Right. But right. then I did. And right. so I was trying to get my head around well, how in the world can you say you're a Muslim, be a Muslim, be culturally a Muslim, and then still be a follower of Jesus. Now I have friends that call themselves Hindu followers of Jesus, Buddhist followers of Jesus, right. followers of Jesus, you know, all of that makes sense to me now. And I agree with you that if we get around uh, Jesus, like I, I still call myself a Jesus follower, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and I think you had, you had begun to get to the point where you were rejecting, like you didn't want to call yourself a Christian or an evangelical right. because that had too much baggage. Right. Right. And you just wanted to throw all that baggage away and just right. simply be Jesus yeah. follower. Well, without and all the it, cultural baggage around. But, that. And, and now it's not just the baggage I want to get rid of. Again, I think it actually has more integrity. It's more real. It's more true. 
to say, I am following Jesus. It's more dynamic, following, I-N-G, it's dynamic. Rather than an, I am a Christian, is static. Yeah. And that typically means in our old world, it means that you prayed a prayer at some point and you got saved <clears throat> and then you're good to go. Yeah. Whereas following Jesus means that either I am or I am not. Like, yeah. you know, on some days I kind of go, no, on that day, I really didn't do a very good job following Jesus. Yeah. I got mad at my friends. I, I yelled at my wife and I cursed my enemies. Yeah. Well, then I'm not following Jesus. I mean, uh, and, and these days in real time, yeah. uh, it's easy for us. We replace our hatred of Muslims and we forgot how much we dislike Russia. So it's like, oh yeah, we, we did, we, that's right. So they're Soviets, right? Oh yeah, right. we don't like them. So now we're so happy to be angry at Russia and we're cursing Putin and he seems curse worthy, right? Because he seems like a, such a scoundrel. But then Jesus comes along and says, love your enemies. And then you, can, you have to at least wrestle with it. You can't pretend like he didn't say that. And then what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know what it means. Like, what does it mean to love the Russian military? <laughs> what does it mean to love Vladimir Putin? I, I literally don't know what that right. means, or, but you can't ignore it. And like even harder, like what does it mean to love a friend that you feel like betrayed you? Well, let's not go there. All right. We won't. <laughs> yeah, thank but you. I've, I've had some of those feelings. Oh, really? And, uh, you have? I have. Yeah, I have. That's so. that. Oh, me too. Can we but, name me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> but no, because we're going to, you remember I said, you remember when we used to talk about loving our enemies, you know? So, oh, yeah, that. Oh, yeah, that. 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 Right, right. Oh, Let's See, stick with you know, that. Stick like with that. that. Oh. Stick with that. No, but I think another thing too is I thought, well, my, I, knew an, I knew so little about the Quran when we had right. these, when we were arguing in the Middle East. Right. That, but I did have it in my mind, like every evangelical has it in their mind that, well, the Quran denies the cross. So how can you, how can you be a, a you know, how can you get saved without the cross? Right? Right. right. And, and that Jesus wasn't God in the flesh. Right. So they didn't believe in the incarnation. That's true. So how can, so how can you, yeah. how can it be okay to not believe in the right Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and my, my thinking at this point was very limited to a set of beliefs, mm -hmm. set of doctrinal beliefs and ascend, ascent to those doctrinal beliefs. Right. Even though I was a good vineyard guy and believe that, you know, a power encounter was right. probably way better than a set of beliefs. Right. Right. We forget. So, yeah. 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 So I did, I did have, when did the disciples get saved? I mean, I, uh, that's a fun question. Isn't that when great? Disciples I, get saved? I think it's when a great the, question. When the disciples believe, I mean, you could see and, their struggle as they're, follow, they're physically following the real, actual physical Jesus of Nazareth for three yeah. freaking years. And the last thing that's recorded that they say to Jesus as he's ascending to heaven in Acts chapter one is, so is now the time that you restore the kingdom of Israel to us? Yeah. And you can just hear Jesus yeah. going, oy vey, you know, yeah, what, have I, right. what have I done? Yeah, they're know? still thinking military exploit. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. They missed the whole thing. Yeah. And then, and, then, and so, so even those, even, the, so when we look at a Muslim who says, oh, I believe in Jesus. And I have all kinds of Christian friends who will say to my Muslim friends, if I ask a Muslim, do you believe in Jesus? Just those words. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Or mm -hmm. do you believe in hundred percent yeah. of Muslims will say, yes, of course. Yeah. And then my Christian friend, thinking that's a good thought to say yeah. this, will say, no, you don't. So why do we, why are we trying to talk people out of them saying they love God or believe? And we say, no, you don't. Right. Uh, first of all, I, Jesus says pretty clearly, don't judge. So the, I think yeah. that's what that means by that is it's not that we can't make judgments of what's right and what's wrong. It's that we are not the judge. Yeah. So we can't, we can't, he's actually given us an out. Yeah. Jesus is being nice to us by saying, don't right. judge. He's right. saying, hey, Carl, relax, dude. You you can't yeah. do that anyway. You can just take a pass on that one. You know? yeah. <laughs> Good news. I think it's not only fun to think about when did the disciples, you know, how what was their conscious sense of following Jesus and what did it mean to them? I don't think they thought in terms of saved or not saved or going to heaven or not going to heaven. I don't think they thought about that. I think they were following a rabbi. Right. That was a radical rabbi that was like a Torah teacher, but in a way it was creative Torah teacher. He was, yeah. you know, reinterpreting the Torah in many ways. And he was upending purity culture and he's upending tribalism. He's upending all different kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. And then I think it's also interesting to think about, well, what did Jesus think about himself too? 
It's like, you know, did Jesus think about himself all the ways that we think about him now? Like, are all the councils that have gone down about Jesus and all these intricate, you know, you know, arguments about dual natures of Christ and Trinity stuff and all was was Jesus ever thinking about all of that stuff that we've put on him? No, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think, think so. I don't think so. Well, the whole Bible, the whole Bible, <laughs> though, if you read the whole Bible as a single monolithic book, you know, 2000 years and 3000 years later, through a Western American lens and right. our case, anyway, as, yeah. as, as Westerners ourselves, and, you know, as a white, uh, a white, in my case, a white Western American Christian background guy who's extremely yeah. well off and privileged in every sense of that word. And, and how can I even read that book with any sense of integrity, with right. any sense of understanding? It's almost, it's almost impossible to do. Yeah. And uh, a few and, scholars have pointed that out, but we need more scholarly work on how to read Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes. I agree 100% because we all have lenses and worldviews that we're completely 100% blind to. And right. we, you know, we can't help it. We, you know, we can't just see it, you know, because yeah. it's just the water that we swim in yeah. when we grow up evangelical or when we, it, yeah. or you could grow up Catholic and swim, in, you know, right. whatever the water right. is that you're taught, trained right. and swim in. Yeah. It's so hard. And what, what's been fun for me is to hear how other people from other faith traditions um, read the same book that I've read for years. And I, I found there's times when I'm like going, holy crud, that's a better insight than I had my whole life growing up oh, with all okay. the studies and all the degrees and everything that I have. And I'll have this Hindu friend that comes up with a thought on a particular right. thing that Jesus said. I'm going, oh, that's great. Right. Like, I, I think I, that's probably more accurate. <laughs> yeah. oh, and uh, and so that that's fun, too. Yeah, um, my friend Samir, you met Samir, right? Yes. My Samir said, he said to me several times, like, I don't know how you Christians can understand Jesus at all. He's a Muslim, you know, Arab Muslim. Yeah. And then we always kind of laugh about that. I used to always think that he was just kind of being funny and making like a, a sarcastic point, but it's true. I don't know how from a Christian, a Western Christian background, you can actually understand Jesus. And, and most of his analogies and parables are agrarian. They're about farmers, and it's they're about soil and land, and they're about uh, relational context that we don't understand here in the West that they would have all understood at that time. Uh, Samir was asked, you know, for a Muslim, the Trinity is a big issue. They don't believe in the Trinity. God is right. just one. And I kept saying, we, we also believe that God is one. And Jesus himself said, the Lord, our God is one. And he points it out to me in, in the, our favorite Trinitarian verse, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, which we know then is Jesus, because it says later in that chapter, the word became flesh. In the beginning was the word, the word is with God, and the word was God. And I said, look at that. It says right there, the word was God. And he goes, what about the word with? And I said, what, what do you mean the word with? And he said, right there, it says the word was with God. He said, Carl, you're with me right now, which means that you're not me. You can't be with something if you are that thing. And I was like, I've never even noticed that word before. <laughs> we focus on the word was God, but we forget uh -huh. the word before that, the word with yeah. God. And yeah. so I, you know what I said to Samir? It was like one of those moments where you actually have a good, a good thought. It happens to me once in a while. I said, maybe it's both. Maybe it's both, Samir, with and was. And he goes, oh, okay. And right. so for the Middle Eastern mind, that dissonance, the dissonance that those yeah. two can't be the same, is okay. That's yeah. fine because they're Middle Easterners. Right. <laughs> right. Well, explain that, you know, our classic, uh, you know, I love C.S. Lewis, you know, but his classic um, argument about Lord Liar Lunatic, yeah. it's a famous right. one. And I loved, I, I love the, right. I love the yeah. rational, you know, I, I just thought that was such a great, great argument. It um, is. If and, you're a rationalist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but you're a talk about, but talk about that a little bit, because yeah. I think that's yeah. so interesting from a Middle Eastern perspective, how that argument just kind of falls apart. Totally. Because talk I about would, that. I mean, early because, on, again, good memory, because early on, I would use that because I love C.S. Lewis and yeah. still do. And I do. Yeah, I do, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, he's such a brilliant thinker. And so I would, right. I would bring out the Lord, you know, if Jesus said, I am the way, you know, mm -hmm. 
he kind of used John 14, 6 usually with that one. And if he said that, then he either, he either was or he wasn't. He was a liar. He just made that up knowing mm-hmm. that it wasn't true. It was crazy. It was a lunatic. He thought he was, but it wasn't. You know, or he's Lord. You know, it's one of those three. And so I would say it to my Muslim friends, and they would go, they would first of all be offended that I would suggest Jesus could be a liar or a lunatic. They were offended by that, which right. is, you know, that made him really mad. And they knew that he's not the Lord, which, you know, in Arabic, it's interesting that the word for Lord, Arab, is the same word you use for God. Like literally, it's the, it's the word that you would use for God. So you're saying Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or God. And none of those three options made any sense to an Arab Muslim mind or heart. And so they would say, no, it's not one of those three. I would literally diagram it sometimes on a whiteboard or something. <laughs> saying, Actually, in good Western logic, it ha- if you say it about yourself, it can only be three options. Exactly. They would say, no, uh, it's, the, it's the fourth one. <laughs> and I would say, well, what's the fourth one? There is no fourth one. They're like, well, yeah, there obviously has to be a fourth one because it's not one of those. So there must be a fourth one. Well, what is it? I'd be like, okay, smarty pants. So what is it? What is it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And they would just be like, Carl, you're an idiot. How do we know? How do we know what the fourth one is? Right. I mean, you know, it's something else. We don't know what it yeah. is. There was no, there was no dissonance in their mind. Right. At all. Mystery know? and paradox makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Exactly. <laughs> perfect exactly. sense. The fact that you don't believe in that just means that you're an idiot. Right. <laughs> It's so something, you know, and it's funny, like even the verse, you know, the classic verse, I'm the way, the truth and the life, which I, I don't think has anything to do with how most evangelicals interpret that. Right. right. You know, I would, I I think we've missed the point on that whole passage. Right. We we, we make a very narrow, we we use that as an exclusivist argument. Right. I agree. It's not. Yeah. It's not that at all. And that's not how Jesus intended it. And the truth itself isn't even a rational set of beliefs like what we think right. Westerners think that's not how Jesus even used that term. Aletheia was a different concept. Well, it was a relational thing, you know, and another and, favorite Fred, have you seen this, that Jesus says two things that are, that are diametrically opposed. One time he says, if you're not for me, you're against me. Another time he says, if you're not against me, you're for me. Mm-hmm. Literally once at one's in Luke, one's yeah. in Mark. Look at, and they're mm-hmm. quite different. They're the same if you're not for me, you're against me is very exclusivist. That's what an exclusive, you know, Jesus is the only way evangelical would love. Mm-hmm. But the other one is the opposite. If you're not against me, you're for me is very inclusive. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know many people who are yeah. actually against Jesus. So yeah. there he says, if you're not against me, you are for me. Yeah. And now it makes everybody feel very uncomfortable if you're from an evangelical background. Yeah. And that's what I love about the scriptures is that they, it does say you can find, you can find Rob Bellion, uh, Brian McClarion, Richard Rorian, Fuzzy Woozy <laughs> Progressive <laughs> Theology throughout the scriptures. And you can find yeah. John MacArthur, John Piper exclusive throughout the scriptures. You can. And I love it's, that about it. I love and I it. Say, and I say it's everybody picks and chooses, right? Of course we did. And I was I was listening to to Brian McLaren. You mentioned him, and he, you know, you sounded like, what if what if evangelicals instead of going to, you know, John, you know, that I am the way, the truth, and the life passage. What if they went to everyone who loves God knows God, and that was the one we quoted when exactly. we were talking. You know what I mean? It's like, exactly. it's what why pick why pick the one verse that sounds exclusive when you can exactly. pick twenty five others that sound inclusive, right? It's because we're insecure, and when you're insecure, you want to make yourself the hero of the story and we want to be right and if you're an insecure evangelical then you want to say that everybody's against me the culture wars wars exist you know they're teaching our kids to be gay in school and they're you know all of a sudden we love ukraine we should love russia and prayer in school i mean just all there's all this nonsense because we're insecure and that's what happens when you're insecure is you actually create enemies that that don't exist and evangelical christians in the west have a, a history of having this minority complex where we think it's us against the world and then everything in the world looks like it's actually attacking us whereas i don't know anybody who's waking up that day thinking let's attack evangelical christians and yeah. Make them look bad. yeah just we're insecure because we're, we're insecure because we're standing on shaky ground most of the time that's why yeah we're and I remember when I when I finally did get that first trip booked to the Middle East, you know, I flew into Beirut um, 
and uh, I was younger and blonder hair and all that kind of stuff. But I had people in my church like, why are you doing that? Right. You're risking your life, you know, just, just flying there in their right. minds. I was going to get killed because it's, I'm <laughs> flying into the land of Muslims. And so they're just going to kill me, period. Right. That's for sure. Which, by the way, when I was taking my, when I was trying to get my church down to the urban core and the African-American core in Kansas City, and they thought the same thing. If they got down there, they'd probably get shot, you know. Yeah, and so, so, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, know. so I'm like, I'm just always trying to take people in the into the places they don't want to go, right? And no, uh, so I fly over there and say, well, you know, if I die, I die. But you know, yeah. it's like <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. But then I get over there, and I probably experienced more hospitality, yeah, from course. from the Muslim community, of course, like in their homes. Yeah. treating me like royalty yeah. probably like my mom's from Georgia, Southern hospitality, but I would say the Muslim hospitality is the most hospitable culture perhaps yeah. I've ever been to Yeah, I agree. Arab, Arab Muslim culture. And wow. And then I came back with those reports. Yeah. Well, these people were some of the nicest people. And we talked about Jesus all the time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. And they like Jesus. I know. Yeah, but they don't really like him. They don't really like him. But, like but yeah, but then but then there's all those passages in the Quran yeah. where they want to kill everybody. Right, right. They really secretly are being your friend, but they really want to kill you. Oh my God. I, that kills that just that's what kills me. Actually, you know, it line up all the violent passages in the Bible. And I've like, said this. I said it. Like I said, you've ever one. read the Bible? Yeah, it's 10 to 1. The Bible is more violent than the Quran. But we right. we know how to we know how to get around that or ignore that or pretend like that's not really part of the Bible. You know, we we have ways of dealing with that. Well, so do most Muslims. So do most, they. Most Muslims, they they know that that verse was at a specific time and place in a battle. And, and so do Jewish rabbis. Of course, of course. They and, get a <laughs> and, and if you're a crazy Christian, if you're a crazy Christian, you can use those Old Testament verses to do crazy stuff. And if you're a crazy Muslim, you can use those bad verses in the Quran right. to do crazy stuff. Exactly. So, well, what a surprise. Of course. And the history is full of people doing crazy stuff with, <laughs> sure. with those things. And our turns out. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the think about the why do why do so many people don't want to have anything to do with the church, Christianity? Is it because of Jesus? Or is it because of what Christians have done in Jesus's name? You know, it's just like it's just crazy. So yeah. Oh, wow. We could go on and on and on. That's easy. Yeah. But I think we're like, so, so where, where are you, where do you feel like you're after all of that evolving? Where, where are you at now? What are you trying to do now? Let's plug your books a little bit, your website, simply Jesus. Let's talk about some of that. Cause we're running out of time. Yeah. And I could no, talk forever. You know, we've talked for hours about this stuff. So oh, no, you and I could, we could have a 20 hour, we do yeah. a podcast <laughs> marathon, a pot a thon Yeah. And just have bath and, and just have bathroom breaks. Yeah. 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 yeah we, could, <laughs> we could just take the computer with it. No, maybe, no, no, maybe not that, but um, yeah. I mean, where, where am I? I mean, I still am in love with God. I still think Jesus is the most inter interesting figure of all time, the most compelling human that ever lived. I actually still believe that he was divine. He was in some way, div although I believe that we also have divinity in us as well. So that that distinction between us and Jesus is blurred a little bit more than that would have in the past. I still think that Jesus is good for everyone, that if everybody knew the actual Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah Jesus, that they would want to follow him. They, they would want, I wouldn't have to talk them into it. They would want to, if they could actually see him. But we certainly want to embrace, they certainly want to embrace some of his lifestyle and teaching for, for sure. sure. You know, for who sure. wouldn't? Yeah, who, I don't know, who atheists who wouldn't want to do the Beatitudes. That's, that's exactly I really right. don't. That's exactly you know, right. I mean, yeah. if you look at the ethics of Jesus in the, yeah. the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. They're just good. I mean, the world would be a better, healthier, more loving, kind, gentler place if we yeah. followed Jesus. Yeah. And yeah. then what he and you do with each other, do you believe he's God and that he's your savior or not? I think it's up to you and Jesus to decide that, you know, and if you don't want to believe that, then don't believe it. And whether you go into hell or not hell or hell exists or heaven even exists or, oh, I mean, all that, that's back to the Jesus's words to me, Carl, you're not the judge. 
Mm-hmm. Like literally, I'm not, so I can't decide that. And I don't, and I don't know that. Yeah. So, and you know, in the recovery world, you know, like people say, you know, we're not afraid of hell. We've been through it. Right. That's what they say right. in the recovery world. You know, it's like, hell, That's we, right. yeah, we, we've been there. We know, we know. <laughs> yeah. So I still, um, I still, we still love going to hard places. I still love being the guy that will go to someplace that people think you shouldn't go to because in that, that place, like you mentioned, inner city, Kansas city, or, you know, Beirut, Lebanon, you know, I've been to Somalia, you know, the inside of Somalia, I've been to Saudi Arabia many times, you know, you go to places where you think South, we were just in South side Chicago, just two weeks ago, you know, places where you think you can't go there because, you know, fill in the blank with something bad. Mm-hmm. Well, let's just go there. Right. And, but you can't talk about Jesus there. Oh, really? Well, let's go talk about Jesus. Yeah, there. right. Exactly. Not Christianity, not Christianity, but Jesus. And Jesus. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I love that about you, Carl. Thanks, man. You've, I love that you've done me. that. You've done that your whole life. Yeah. You really have. Yeah. And, um, I love that. Well, thank you. Yeah. So your books, Muslims, <laughs> Christians, and Jesus, <laughs> Tea with Hezbollah. By the way, I met, uh, you did that with Ted Decker. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember or not, but when he did one of his uh, novel book tours, you set it up to where he came to my church. He came and we, to your church, yeah. We did a book signing. So I met yeah. Ted. Yep. Um, speaking of Jesus, simple ways to reach out to Muslims. Yes. 42 seconds. Am I missing one? Uh, no, my uh, adventures, adventures in saying yes, 42 seconds. Speaking of Jesus, Muslim, Christian, Jesus, tea with us as well. Yeah, that's it. That's okay. It. Then, yep. So and you can all, go, they're all on Amazon. You can, are. do you have a website that yeah, it's just you want people? It's my name. Do I have, I guess I do. I have carlmaderos.com and then our simplyjesusgathering.com is probably a more interesting website with, with great, great material on it. That's all free. Simplyjesus.com. Is that it? Simplyjesusgathering.com. Simplyjesusgathering.com. Yeah. And then we're doing it. We're doing a Simply Jesus Gathering. Just a bunch of friends camping out in the wilderness this summer, June, June 9th through 12th. Okay. All fun. right. You should come. Email me if any of you want in Kansas City folks want to go. Yeah. I'm, I might go. I don't know. I, oh, I haven't committed on. yet, but anyway. Come on. Yeah, come yeah. On. They, they, <laughs> It'd be fun. It would be, be fun. fun. It would be fun. All right. That's Excellent, man. man. Thanks. All right. That. You bet. Carl, tell your tell Chris I said hey. I will. Um, I know, I know I've met all your kids, don't know them quite as well, but probably yeah. know Anna the best. But yeah. tell your tell your kids I said hello. I and I look forward to seeing you the next time. Appreciate yeah. you. Love you. Thanks for that being on you. spirituality adventures. And I love you. I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. And I love this. I love I love Thank that you. title. I really do. I think it's so cool. Well, I love adventures. Yeah. And then I, I, the way I define spirituality now is connection with self, others, and something greater than you. Oh, I like that. So, I say that. yeah. That's good. That's so that's nice. what I do. And then I say this is a non judgmental place to explore spirituality. I love it. So, so I interview everybody, stories, all kinds of stuff. It's fun. It's been really fun. Yeah. yeah. Way to go. I need to get some of our uh, Muslim follower of Jesus friends on here. Yeah. Maybe you can help yeah. me set up a oh, couple of those. Oh, yeah. I'd love that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. It'd be yeah, great. Yeah. All right, man. Bye, buddy. Thank you. Take care. God bless. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. See you next time. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.